Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 464 that's 464 with me your host Agassino Zynga how you doing how you feeling great amazing good to hear if it's your first time check out the show you know what to do via youtube smash that like hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you listen via the podcast app a five star review and a share will help the show go a long way i've just recently actually checked let me see i've got a couple of new reviews on there as per usual but it'll be great if i could get a few more so if you haven't subscribed if you haven't reviewed the show on your podcast app wherever you listen to then make sure you do that that would obviously help it to go a long way it's free it takes you only a couple of minutes to do so if you can spare a couple of minutes to do so then and make sure you review the show on your podcast app and of course support via patreon is always more than welcome as well i've got bonus shows on there movie reviews other extra bonus content available only through patreon so make sure you check that out at patreon.com for slash agostino that's patreon.com for just agostino you'll find the link in the show notes below i've got 12 ratings so far so that's pretty good i had one prior which which is something that i rate myself so thank you for all the ratings that have been put on there it's greatly greatly appreciated but here we are back again um record sweltering day here in the uk i think might be the third day um in a row of record heat wave which is a good thing i think for most people um i think for someone like myself it's obviously a bad thing with my allergies and my tendency to you know my nostrils to flare up um have a weird chesty cough have to take you know copious amounts of allergy tablets and stuff so it obviously isn't the best if you've got any form of seasonal allergies but you know what can you do what can you do um this is an article here from the bbc documenting it saying uk records hottest day of the year third day in a row it's interesting as well because this sort of stuff only happened to me very very late in life i think prior to turning 18 i didn't have any issues with being outdoors for you know prolonged period of time i grew up in a fairly latchkey kind of society right where effectively your parents let you go out from any time um after school all the way until you know 11 sometimes 12 at night and sometimes uh, you know longer obviously on the weekend you have to you, you basically go out from the morning all the way until the evening so there was a lot of time spent outdoors and I never really had a problem with hay fever whatsoever. And then suddenly out of nowhere, after all those years of playing Sunday league football, rolling around in the flipping bushes, you know, doing all sorts of madness, lighting fires. You remember that sort of thing? When you used to go into a park and just light fires, you know, retarded stuff like that, flying kites, um, doing all that nonsense. And then suddenly now at this grand old age of mine, I've suddenly developed, you know, allergies and stuff, seasonal allergies, sports related allergies, wherever it is, it's annoying, it's embarrassing. I have to carry around these little, you know, inhalers on me just to make sure that i'm in adequate physical condition gotta take these dumb tablets as well remember to take them all the time it's just annoying i i'm, I'm a fairly low maintenance type of dude and having to you know do all these other extenuating things in order to make sure that i'm a functioning human it just 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 it drives me up the wall it drives me up the wall but what can you do the bbc article says it's been the hottest day of the year in the uk for the third day in a row temperatures reached 28.3 degrees centigrade uh centigrade sorry, celsius centigrade celsius in north hall west london on wednesday afternoon it beat the previous day's high of 26.1 in cardiff on the first day of the metrological summer but there's been uh, showers and even thunderstorms in some areas with those uh, spreading north as they progress more warm weather is expecting for many parts of the uk this week but it will then start to call cool out the forecast i say I, I love a good summer rain you know when it's really you know scorching hot and all of a sudden you get a flash rain there's nothing better than that i remember once you know spending the summer in new york this is the first time i went maybe early 2010 ish times and experiencing that for the first time right where they have really good summers i took one of my um garb store caggles there with me right? it's a little rain jacket with a waxed outer layer thinking i was looking hard and cool and then it obviously started raining so i wore out and about in the streets but then quickly after you know in a space of like 30 minutes the sun came out it started blaring again and legitimately all the puddles in the street completely dried up and i was left you know carrying this really sticky and wet rain jacket but um I should have just done what all the locals did, right? Whenever the rain comes, it just run into a bodega or run underneath a canopy somewhere and yawning or whatever it may be. But definitely wearing rain jackets and that sort of weather isn't the best thing. Just actually better just to kind of acclimatize with whatever weather happens to take part during that time. 
but yeah people out indoors enjoying it and i'm holed up inside being like i'm not going outdoors <laughs> oh what could you do bbc weather forecaster billy payne said it was also the warmest day of the year in scotland um in what's that word called uh atch atch nugget hitting is it how you spell it atch nugget however you say that hitting 24 4.4 Celtic grays as well as wales where temperatures reach 26.5 parts of southeast england saw cooler temperatures however with showers and thunderstorms in some areas the forecaster said that thursday would be a very warm again especially in the east coast of england with temperatures around 27 uh, degrees Celsius. the weather would then slightly be more unsettled but would then return to cold wet um, weather of the last month the average of june of july is 21st point 21 points 21 point i mean 21 celsius grade i'm not saying this right at all uh with the early days of the month around 20 is celsius grade celsius what am i saying what i keep saying celsius grade i don't know why i keep saying celsius grade. it's celsius but regardless it's really hot it's really warm out here people are enjoying themselves as you can see from these pictures of these lovely ladies in the park and people enjoying sitting underneath trees and whatnot you know and i'm just you know in here trying my best not to move too much in order to get all hot and sticky the interesting part of this whole thing is that this is just right on par with the summers that we have in the uk usually you would imagine this sort of weather would happen you know around when the start of summer right may whenever it was um obviously maybe march maybe sometimes right in february if you're being lucky but it always happens towards the end and then you would have like a, a prolonged period of pretty crap weather and then by the time not the whole carnival time comes around for some odd reason the sun always shows up so maybe this is a good omen for that ha happening in it which is still odd considering they've cancelled everything else they've cancelled brighton pride they've cancelled all these other festivals and stuff but for some reason not Hill carnival hasn't really said a word about what's going on there it would be really odd if that was hap if that was allowed to go ahead i guess it could go ahead because from what i've read so far the really the thing stopping these big events going forward is mostly due to insurance like no organizer wants to take the li on the liability themselves right in case something does go wrong you don't want to be entirely liable as a company or event organizer because more often than not if that does go wrong you're definitely going to be out of business very quickly with the amount you have to pay out and damages and whatnot so they want to obviously spread the liability and of course if you've been out of business for a very long period of time it's very unrealistic to expect that you have the cash reserves to weather any kind of you know outbreak or whatever it may be cause you put the event on so you're taking a really calculated risk and i guess if you're like a smaller festival if you're like a club night or something you could probably do that it's not too much of a hassle right 200 to 400 people in a venue somewhere it's it's all it's all well and good but if you're a festival and you're expecting to have, you know, thousands plus people kind of entering whatever space it is that you're holding your event at, it's just not worth it to allow them to all just, you know, um, loiter around the streets without any protection from the insurance companies that they offer. So let's see what happens. It'll be interesting. I think it'll be obviously a good thing for everyone's morale to kind of end the summer, quote unquote, with a street celebration of not your carnival. They were obviously is the prospect of it being one of the most stickiest and risk um laden events out there considering everyone you know did you see the videos the other day of that kid in hyde park there was this video that went viral on social media here in the uk where these kids were scrapping in hyde park our big park here in central london and um they were chasing each other around with knives and shit and one of the kids i think ended up getting critically injured i think he's in hospital still now at the moment right hopefully he's gonna be okay but that's just another sign of just you know people just not being out outdoors enough obviously due to being locked in with a coof and then suddenly being allowed out allowed outdoors it's now hot and sunny people are acting out i remember when i was younger at that age you just you know you end up feeling like superman when you're outdoors for no apparent reason and you end up just acting out and doing a whole lot of nonsense and that was what we basically saw with that kind of attack in the hyde park so for as much good as it could bring having no idea kind of will be a great sort of way to kind of end a really crappy 14 or so months it might be the worst thing to happen so maybe just to avoid any trouble you just let the summer play out as is and then hopefully come back again next year you would imagine so but who knows man so far we haven't really had any confirmation from them of what the deal is really let me actually see what what they're saying because i haven't actually heard anything but i think they're, they're purposely trying to play close to ear keep their cars close to their chest just to make sure um, they give themselves any opportunity to put the event on let's go on news on google here amazing exhibition 
Okay, last update was February, they said, right? And they said they're still planning here, continue to plan as usual despite the uncertainty of COVID. Uh, they respond, what they say? No earlier than June. Okay. I don't know what that means. Let's see what this says. No earlier than June 21st. This is from the 1st of March. Let's see what they said in March. Because so far, we haven't really heard any news from them as to what's actually going on. Um, like I said, it's definitely one of our marquee sort of street festivals here in the UK overall i think um let's see here let's get this off the screen no your kind of response to 2021 inquiries it says no earlier than june 21st according to prime minister boris johnson that the first date that we can hope to see an end to all current legal limits on social contact if all goes to plan it reduces the spread da, 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 nightclubs and face is open um, the government has revealed the plan da, 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 da. what could be of current carnival is there a chance that europe's biggest street festival is that true it's Europe's biggest street festival so i guess after love parade ended Really, of all the street festivals in Europe, you'd, I wouldn't think Nottingham Carnival was the biggest one. I don't know why. I had the impression that there'll be other ones in Europe that'll be much bigger because that whole like outdoors fun stuff. I always kind of think about it more with European countries as opposed to us. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. So, so yeah, the, the which attracts over one million visitors over the August bank holiday could go ahead. Even if the government um, removes all legal restrictions on big outdoor gatherings of its kind, would the organiser want to give a go-ahead to an event if there's even the slightest risk the vaccine fail to control the infections and lockdown has it reimposed? It's clearly the question that the carnival LTD is being asked regularly on website and Twitter account. It replied and said in response to all the inquiries, we're continuing to plan as usual for the cover 2021 and also preparing for every eventuality due to the uncertainty Certainty we are all facing our board will not be making decisions until closer to summer please look out for updates here so they're, they're just keeping it close to their chest they're saying look we're going to continue planning as if it's going to go ahead and you know if we get the go ahead and it's all clear then we're going to do it if not we're going to plan for 2021 but it'll be strange that brian pride can't go on but still new kind of can again maybe they're willing to take the risk but considering all the issues they've been having with local councils and noise pollution stuff and people complaining about antisocial behavior it would just be weird to take that risk now considering what's at stake you know what i mean but again maybe it's a calculated risk willing to take and if you're like hey if you're willing to give the decision to the actual adults who want to go then say if you're willing to go and take the risk then fair enough um we kind of wash our hands of it and leave the responsibility in the citizens hands that could be one way to go about things who completely knows but yeah that's where we're at at the moment that's where we are at what else do we have on the list oh let's me yeah, let's move on to this one this is a in fairly interesting news in the world of um football more so so it appears like according to sky sports news tottenham are in talks with antonio Co antonio conte to replace the exiting um who did they sack jose Mourinho. And then allegedly, or already allegedly, it's been confirmed now, Carl Ancelotti has rejoined Real Madrid as coach, right? So this, I think there was a lot of conversation around Erling Haaland and um, Kylian Mbappe in terms of their transfers were going to dictate, no, sorry, the transfers of Lionel Messi um, specifically and maybe Cristiano to a certain extent were going to it dictate and kind of cause a domino effect with loads of other players moving in the market. And obviously that's, that hasn't happened just yet. But what has happened has been this weird managerial merry-go-round where um, maybe it was the lead, maybe it was the second of Mourinho, maybe kind of prompted it. But the second of Mourinho, uh, Zinedine Zidane leaving, Tuncho obviously being hired by um, Chelsea mid-season and do so well for Chelsea definitely made other clubs take attention. The fact that maybe Lille's manager might be out of a job or leaving Lille too after securing the French league on with them too. There's loads of weird occurrences going on at the moment. And if anything, this is just maybe further highlighted the real gap in terms of how Manchester United fans see our club and how the owners actually see what we're doing in terms of sporting achievement in terms of football greatness in terms of competing for the highest honors in our league because the appointment allegedly if this goes through of Tottenham um, appointing Antonio Conte and obviously hiring this other football director called Fabio Patrici who allegedly was no, who was somebody who was in charge at Juventus when Conte was there too so they quite clearly are aiming to rebuild and kind of rejuvenate their aging squad something that Pochettino pointed out before he was sacked as well but they're also planning to do it with somebody that kind of has synergy with the coach that they're willing to hire so there's a relationship there there's a camaraderie obviously Conte is known to be a bit of a firebrand difficult to work with 
So if you're going to make it as easy as you can for yourself, why not hire and bring in somebody who worked well with him during that time? And then you've got, of course, Real Madrid deciding to move on from Zidane and reappoint to Carlo Ancelotti, who's essentially a safe pair of hands. If you want to hire somebody who can maybe transition the squad out of the, you know, Bale, uh, which was his name, uh, Benzema, Sergio Ramos, all these kind of aging Real Madrid legends and sort of ushering a new um, door that Real Madrid, the best person to do it with is maybe their greatest man manager, right? Somebody who a lot of players have a lot of time for. Um, he's very well, well, well regarded. Um, Ramos even had a lot of great things to say about him during his time there. And a lot of the players were actually disappointed when he got fired. I think in 2015 it was. So there's a lot of kind of um, sense in this decision. Of course, Ancelotti's sake, you know, even though his time at Everton wasn't the best, you know, getting the call from Real Madrid was just a no-brainer. I'd imagine his contract he signed at Everton probably had a couple of clauses in it where if a certain club of a certain stature approached him during his time at Everton, if he'd done a good job, that he could uh, trigger a move and maybe buy himself out of it, of the contract, wherever it may be, or trigger an exit kind of strategy. And that's what he eventually ended up doing. But these two transfers or these two managerial appointments, uh, one potential in Tottenham getting Conte and obviously one confirmed with Ancelotti going to um, going back to Real Madrid after joining Everton, are a clear indication that these teams are striving to win trophies. They're striving to win the league title. They're striving to compete for the biggest honours. What we're doing at Man United at the moment, from what I've seen, again, looking from afar, it just looks like the remit has suddenly changed in terms of what's kind of a, deemed to be a success. Maybe it's because of the level of manager we've got in Solskjaer. You can't really expect him to maybe achieve the heady heights of winning the league or winning title or winning trophies consistent on a consistent basis because he's a bit of a you know average manager in that regard. And it's mostly about the things in and around him being in place in order for him to do his best work. Some would argue that. I don't really think that's true, but some would argue that's the case. What's interesting is that we've suddenly approached this period in time with Solskjaer where because we've been able to qualify for the Champions League, I think now two seasons in a row, we've basically been able to see that without trophies, the two seasons in a row qualifying for the Champions League in the top four is basically a clear indication that we're okay being a team that finishes the top four without winning trophies because the number one remit to be a successful Man United coach right now is top four football. If you don't get top four football and you still win the Champions League, you can still get fired because the Glazers want that European money. They want that prestige. Um, they want that access, that guaranteed income that comes in season in, season out. Um, but they don't want to actually compete for to win the actual trophy itself, right? They don't actually bother that winning the trophy. And same goes for the Premier League, right? Top obviously we're finishing in the top four, you obviously get a bigger purse. But they don't actually care about trying to compete for the league title. It's a bonus if we do, maybe win a League Cup and FA Cup, but that's just about it. And I think for as much conversation as there is around social being replaced, I think the real onus needs to be placed once more on the Glazers needs to be placed once more on the overall structure we have at the moment. I think I read an article prior on the podcast about allegedly um, Solskjaer was um, going to be offered a new three-year contract, right? A reward for basically failing to win the Europa League against Villarreal, right? A club that's never won the Europa League. Um, I guess Unai Emery, a, club, a, a manager who Arsenal thought wasn't good enough and went to you know Villarreal and ended up winning the Europa League and knocking out Arsenal along the process and obviously beating us in the final. But hey, we put that to one side. We've obviously seen now with Solskjaer that those trophies don't really matter. Just the league titles is good enough and it's really concerning, which is why I say the attention needs to be put back onto the Glazers and the overall structure of the club. I think we alarm bells should have been ringing for all fans when the club decided to hire John Moto or to promote John Moto internally to be the director of football for the director after many, many years of forced dawns and telling us that they were doing extensive searches and they were kind of scouring the world for the best people to take over that position because obviously in most big clubs having a kind of overall director of football who kind of lays out the overall plan and visions for the club going forward maybe in five-year increments maybe 10-year increments is very important at the top level because i think the understanding is that you're always going to change managers you're always going to be um, rotating managers or rotating players they're going to come and go but you need to have an overall vision that kind of stays in place so that you can have managers and players that can fit that vision better as opposed to in the past where Arsene Wenger and you know Sirs Ferguson were in charge where essentially the manager dictated the vision of the club but then in that regard you need your manager to stay long to make that vision 
and to make those players acquisitions make sense you can't just be keep hiring different managers as we've done you know man united you know from Moyes to van Gaal to Mourinho, three managers with three completely different outlooks on how they play football and tactically and philosophically whatever it may be so you end up with like you know three different types of players essentially and so if you hire out to football you have this one cohesive vision and obviously united finally did it at the last minute that we hire internal hire of somebody that's supposed to be at the club ever since david Moyes was there so it's going back what seven or so years um it hasn't really shown any kind of ability to really um you know compete or to battle on the same footing as some of the other stellar director footballs out there in world football and essentially somebody who is you know very happy and okay with the job that you know Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is doing right now United so there's no pressure on him that way in terms of that success and then in terms of the actual evaluating of players and how we hide them all that sort of malarkey it's all done by a weird committee where Solskjaer is still involved where he shouldn't be it's just it's a complete mess and I think for as much bad as Oli Solskjaer has done which he has done I think the real pressure needs to be put on the coaching I mean on the overall structure of our club because what we've seen so far from Oli is that he's never going to admit that his coaching staff isn't good enough. He's never going to be, um, he's never going to have the guts to maybe say he's not good enough and we just step away and get someone else to take over the job. He's never going to call out the Glazers and say that they're not adequately backing him in terms of signings because he's quite clearly shown us he can't be a coach that's going to bring out the best in, you know, mediocre players. He's going to need high quality first team players that can just step in and play for him to be anywhere successful in this club we haven't actually seen the evidence of it because we won a trophy but in order for him to actually be successful the only way he can do it is by having really really good players um the Glazers are unwilling to spend a lot of money especially since we've qualified for the Europe, for the champions league we always do this every time we need to finish in champions league we spend money every time we, we are in champions league we don't spend that much money so the real pressure should be put on the owners because i feel like if we had a better structure and we had better people at the club who were really, you know, had the best sporting interests of the club to heart. Someone like an Oli Solskjaer wouldn't be at the club for so long. He wouldn't. He just wouldn't be here for so long. He would have had this season maybe to try and win a trophy. If that didn't happen, he would have got his marching orders regardless of where we finished in the league. Even if we finished second, the points tally doesn't really reflect our performances. Um, the day-to-day -day matches as well weren't really you know nothing to write home about the unbeaten away record doesn't mean crap if you don't win any trophies so he would have been out in a really stringent and kind of methodical clear uh footballing structure that actually had some sporting ambitions tied to it they would have sacked him ages ago but under this current ownership we have at the moment similar to how Arsenal Winger was at Arsenal where he was stinking of the place you know for many years you know qualifying for the Champions League for what I think 12 seasons or so in a row right not really taking the club any further than what they you know some would argue they probably would need Arsenal Winger now but you know what I mean right just settling for that kind of mediocrity essentially put them in such bad positions where they're still probably trying to recover from it now and I feel like for United we're so fortunate in that we actually have decent players who can maybe turn it on on their day so we don't really so a lot of those kind of deficiencies are sort of papered over in some regard but sooner or later they're going to be exposed and i'm just really concerned that we're putting ourselves in a position where we're waiting for ourselves to be on our knees until we make a change right we're waiting for social to get things really really wrong and then suddenly we're going to make a change to change things for the better but still the structure around the players, the structure around the team is not adequately set up in a way to bring out the best in whoever we hire as a coach going forward. And that's a really concerning part. And again, with the appointments potentially of Carl Ancelotti to Everton and oh no, Carl Ancelotti, sorry, going back to Real Madrid and obviously Conte is supposedly maybe going back to Spurs or going back to Spurs, going to Spurs, Pochettino, you know, threatening to leave PSG. There's always big coaches with pedigree, with you know, uh, prestige with whatever it may be called, right? With a good reputation, with actual good, you know, credit in the bank who are there and ready to, you know, maybe, you know, take over and enact some change. It's really disturbing to see us just settling for what Soul Strike has given us at the moment just because we finished second. It's just a very bizarre state to be in at the moment. But, you know, I guess this is what happens in it when you have years and years of mismanagement from the upper levels. It's just, it's, it's always going to come back to roost. And I think this is something that we're just going to have to swallow as United fans. Like, we just can't get away with being... I just think it's unfair for us as United fans to expect us to win stuff, knowing that we have probably one of the worst run clubs in the top four 
easily, maybe in the top 10 in terms of like, you know, footballing people, you know, doing right by the club's heritage and all that malarkey. We're definitely the worst run football club. Um, considering it was actually all our resources and our you know, ability to generate money. It just doesn't make any sense why a club like ours should be in a position to challenge for trophies. But we are. We still finished second. We were in most cup comp- comp- competitions until the, you know, somewhat latter stages as part of the Champions League where we got dumped in the group stages. But for the most part, we did pretty well, right? Um, overall as a season. So there's obviously something there. It just needs a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of direction. It's a little bit of quality. And that means managerial coaching wise, right? It needs quality in there. No one can tell me Solskjaer is a quality coach because he isn't. He leaves United and I'm and I would really be surprised if he gets another top ten job. Really surprised. Um so that's very concerning in that regard. But again, maybe it's just something we just have to swallow. I just don't see United challenging for trophies and league titles with the Glazers in charge, with John Moto as a director of football, with Darren Fletcher as his assistant. It just doesn't work like that. You have to have high quality people in those positions in order to bring out the best in whatever you do have as a club. It just doesn't work like you just sign a, a good coach and then suddenly you start winning things in the papers over all the other cracks. It doesn't work like that anymore. You need to have structure in place, especially if you're bringing in these really top level coaches who don't really want to be managers anyway who don't want to do all the marketing and sport you know overall responsibilities that Sir Ferguson did before some of them just want to do training sessions if that's the case you're going to have to be able to have people in place who can get them the best players best training facilities best coaches and at the moment we just haven't got that we just haven't got that next one unless we have news here courtesy of Sky Sports concerning the final England squad that it feels like um Gareth Southgate probably you know chickened out of a little bit by naming four centre backs I mean so four right backs which is legitimately one of the most insane things I've seen in a long time but hey you live and go on so this is courtesy of let me see if it's loading on Twitter so I can see the actual final squad list oh there it is so the final squad list reads as follows goalkeepers you've got Dean Henderson Sam Johnson Jordan Pickford I don't think there's any sort of surprises there um, goalkeepers kind of pick themselves then uh, defenders, you've got Trent Alexander-Arnold, Ben Chilwell, Connor, Connor Cody, Rhys James, Harry Maguire, Tyro Mings, Luke Shaw, John Stones, Kieran Trippier. The only thing I'd say in terms of that list of people, I'd say taking four right backs is quite insane, if you think about it, right? And Trent Alexander-Arnold, Rhys James, uh, Kieran Trippier and Carl Walker. It obviously means that Solskjaer was, I mean, Solskjaer, South, he might as well be Solskjaer. Southgate was struggling to make an actual decision on who his number, let's say his top two centre backs would be because I don't think any other team in your Euros is going to take that many right backs. I know full backs are very important in modern day football, but in terms of taking four who play all in the same position, it seems a little bit odd. Um, maybe it means one of them is going to play a little bit further forward. Maybe it's Trent Alexander. Might, Trent Alexander Arnold might play in midfield. He hasn't necessarily played there that often in Liverpool himself. People would say he's definitely more of a ball playing right back as opposed to a defender. He's not the best defender in the world, which is why a lot of people had doubts about him. But again, the media campaigns around Trent Alexander Arnold, especially towards the end of the season, I don't get me wrong, he did turn it on himself. I think the last five or six games he played out of his skin. So he was clearly given a ultimatum, like, you know, make the decision hard for me in terms of my England squad and I may be considered taking you. And he stepped up to the plate and then performed. But every single time he would put in a half decent cross, you know, the Sky Sports commentators who are more often than not, you know, Liverpool fans or closeted Liverpool fans would be coming in their pants about the cross that he put in, the pass that he did. Like, it was just really overboard. And it really let you know that sometimes it really does help if you have friends in the media in terms of how you're viewed as a football player in England. Um, especially if you're not playing for some of the bigger teams you really do need somebody to maybe champion you um, within those Sky Sports studios, BT studios, um, talk sport you need somebody to really really be shouting about you from the highest rooftops because if not no one's going to take any real notice of what you're doing um, Center backs is a bit worrying to take Harry Maguire considering he's not he wasn't fit enough to play in the Europa League final um, again maybe it's just a sentimental thing which is again completely insane when you think of the um, pressure that's going to be on the player just having somebody there just for the vibes doesn't really make any sense to me and again you're playing against some of the best teams in Europe um, with some of the best attacking talent taking a half fit Maguire surely isn't the best way to go forward and again Maguire isn't transformational in a way that you know a modern day Virgil van Dijk is nowadays 
so why would they feel it that necessary to even take him in the first place what difference is it really going to make to have a Harry Maguire in the squad you know, vis-a-vis him not being in the squad especially when you think of you know I forgot who the player is plays for Aston Villa who's at centre back he's had a very good season um, and again there's fairly there's you know John Stones Tyrone Mings all these players can do decent enough jobs Connor Cody and stuff they're not gonna you know they're not world beaters but they're good enough to do a job so it's really interesting that he did that um, midfielders Jude Bellingham Jordan Henderson Mason Mount Calvin Phillips Declan Rice um, I guess Jordan Henderson's another one who hasn't been fit the last few seasons last few games of the season I think he might have taken a position of James Ward-Prowse who'd probably be unlucky at not getting a spot in the team but again would he have played anyway probably not so it's a weird thing because Southgate clearly has his favourites so if he has his favourites what's the point of taking people who are just going to sit on the bench throughout the entire tournament and not play you know he might as well take players that he's actually going to you know end up rotating and stuff going forward and then forwards they've got Dominic Calvert-Lewin Phil Foden Jack Grealish who I'm really happy about seeing there because you know he ended the season quite badly with his injury and stuff and I was thinking because he doesn't play with some of the big marquee clubs you never know you know they might end up leaving him out there but he's going to be the real um, the real kind of killer when it comes to um, who performs best for England in the Euros you got Harry Kane Marcus Rashford Bukayo Sacco Jadon Sancho and Raheem Sterling Marcus Rashford is probably lucky to get into that team. If you think about people that are on form playing well, um, Jesse Lingard is very lucky not to get in there, especially considering the last six months or so that he's played well at West Ham. Um, it's just, you know, the same way people are saying that, oh, he's only played well the last six games because you know, double signers is insane. Um, Trent Alexander-Arnold played pretty poorly the first half of the season, turned it on the second half of the season, or maybe the, the second the last quarter of the season and he, now he's back in the England squad and no one's really saying much but then when people bring up Jesse Lingard's name and say oh he only played well for one half of the season right because he got Wednesday went on loan uh, from January going onwards but he still performed he still outperformed Marcus Rashford I think he's maybe the second highest scoring Englishman um, outside of Harry Kane right even above someone like a Dominic Calvert-Lewin and you imagine for the versatility of uh, uh, Jesse Lingard the fact that he can play in midfield he can play up front um, his way of playing in terms of his one two touches, his a bit you know, his pace off the ball, his pace on the ball. Um, he's kind of you know, he's basically a really good impact sub as well. Even if he doesn't start, he's really good coming on for the bench. Um he's a big game player. He's had, you know, some very sterling performances for um England in the Euros and of course in the World Cup. You'd imagine he'd be a great addition overall to this kind of squad harmony. He's a good vibes guy. Do you know what I mean? Very popular with people within that England setup. But again, sometimes when favourites are there, favourites are there. So there is obviously some remit for him actually maybe still getting the squad because I can easily see some of these strikers, especially someone like a Marcus Rashford, who just the other day was saying that he was been injured since September. It's odd that he's to go into the Euros, but again, you know, let it be, let it be. He's speaking to Barack Obama, so it makes sense, I guess, for some people. So let's see, man. It's a fairly decent squad. Again, no real big surprises, I think, overall, especially when you consider Southgate's, you know, other um, call-ups that he does throughout the year, especially in the friendlies and stuff, it gives a good indication of who he kind of favours going forward. Um, it's just a right-back situation that's a real cop-out in my in my head. I think all the debates over over the start of the season about who he's going to take and the idea that he might have to leave Trent Alexander-Arnold at home kind of made him, you know, include four in a setup. is just wild. Four right-backs is just <laughs> legitimately one of the most insane things I've ever seen in my life. But hey, let's see maybe it won't really count for nothing anyway because it's very unlikely that England will progress that far going forward I think it's very very unlikely next in terms of um, sporting news we have this courtesy of the Athletic Jake Paul former um, UFC, UFC champion Tyron Woodley agreed to boxing match pretty insane isn't it YouTube star Jake Paul and former W I'm sorry UFC welterweight champion Tyron Woodley have agreed to a deal for a boxing match sources told the athletic Mike Coppinger uh, Paul most recently won by knockout against UFC veteran Ben Askren who had a 19 and two MMA record in the first round of their main event at the Triller Fight Club celebrity boxing event on April 17th but again that's what I mean when you put stuff in just text form that's what fighting is so um it's so ephemeral you know whatever that would that term is because we just put it in like black and white like that right ben askren um who had an mma record of 19 and two and he got beat in the first round by a youtuber it makes it sound way worse than what it actually was but askren was coming off you know 
two fairly brutal um, losses, especially in the case of his loss to Jorge Masvidal. He's obviously had, you know, debilitating injuries that eventually led him to retire from uh, MMA, considering, you know, he had to get, I think, hip surgery, right? Which I imagine isn't the most easiest thing to recover from, especially in terms of athletically. And he's never really been a great striker anyway. It's mostly a grappling dude, mostly a wrestling kind of guy. So going up to face somebody like a, um, like a, um, like a Jake Paul, considering how much bigger he is, considering how more experienced he is in the ring, you know, striking, it was always going to be an uphill task, but we were still hoping as MMA fans that Ben Askren would maybe pull it together and be able to maybe, you know, uh, I don't know, tie up Jake Paul, make him, you know, whatever, just make the fight awkward, land some things, but quite soon you definitely saw that the jab power, the overall power overall, the stature, the speed was just too much. And, you know, Ben Askren was definitely on his kind of, you know, the tail end of his career and embarrassingly getting knocked out in a way that he did. It was just hard to take. So when I see stuff like this with Tyron Woodley and Jake Paul, as much as I would love Tyron Woodley to knock Jake Paul's head off his shoulders, it, I just can't see it happening, right? I just can't, like... Jake Paul's going to win again and he's going to one by one take out all these veterans that everyone's kind of grown to love over the years and solidify himself as the you know undisputed legend killer of the UFC that's what Jake Paul will eventually be it continues here it says uh, the, the, as, as a pro boxer Paul has a three and a record um, he knocked out former NBA player that seems like ages ago now right Nate Robinson last November Paul 24 recently signed a multi fight deal with Showtime Sports again they get into the paper these, these fucking poor brothers they're smashing it Woodley's last fight in the UFC was a loss to Vicente Luque in March Woodley 39 boasts a 19-7 and 1 professional MMA record and is riding a 4 fight losing streak the last 2 by finish inside personality Logan Paul Jake Paul's brother is set to face Hall of Fame boxing champion Floyd Mayweather an exhibition match in June 6th, which is initially set for February 20th. Da, da, da. So, on paper, you would still say that Jake Paul is definitely the favorite for this because if you look at Tyron Woodley's record, this is a retirement looking record on from Tapology, right? Like, whoever this freak of an athlete was back in the day with the power and the speed and the aggression that he had, it's just not the same Tyron Woodley. So, if you scan down to his record here on Tapology, you see that, of course, he's coming off a four fight losing streak. His last win coming against Darren Till in 2018, right? Win by Dash Choke. The one after before that was that kind of uh, tetchy fight against Damian Meyer, which then followed the Stephen um, Thompson fight. Yeah, two fights in a row, which were pretty tense in terms of the lack of striking and moving from both. They were trying to both kind of counter each other. It was just a bit of a dead stalemate. Obviously, the Darren Till performance was really impressive, considering Darren Till, how highly regarded he is. And then, you know, the downhill trajectory started with Kamaru Usman, right? Completely dismantling him from beginning to end. And then, of course, the lost decision to Gilbert Burns was brutal. Um, the Colby Covington uh, fight as well was brutal, considering their back and forth. Uh, Vicente Luque as well completely demolishing him even though uh, this was maybe Tyron Woodley's best fight because it was I think the last one fight in his contract so he kind of went out and he shielded a bit more but whatever we've seen in these last four fights is that Tyron Woodley's punching power isn't what it used to be I know there's a quote now being attributed to Sylvester Stallone where he says something along the lines of um he thinks Tyron Woodley's gonna win because supposedly the last thing to go for as a you know former pro fighter is your punching power you might lose your speed you might lose your agility maybe some of your coordination and your timing no not coordination, maybe your timing but in terms of your actual power if you've always had power you that's the last thing to go so if that's true he's still got a puncher's chance but it's not as if jake paul doesn't hit hard he completely hits hard too you see what happens to nate robinson fair enough nate robinson's not a boxer don't get me wrong but from what we saw when he got touched he felt that you saw from Ben Askren, when he got touched, he felt that. Um, so far, the only person to really go the distance, I feel like, with um, Jake Paul has been Deji, isn't it? Right? He went, not distance, but he went five rounds or something, if I'm not mistaken, with Jake Paul. So, I just don't see where this is going to end well for Tyron Woodley. I really don't. Um, he, we've not seen that power. We've not seen him let his hands go in the ring, in the octagon, especially in the UFC. It's been really frustrating to see how he has, over the years, kind of diminished in terms of his power, his stature, his um, intimidation appeal, right? In the ring, he used to be, you know, that kind of muscular, flipping 
big bum, you know, massive thigh, kind of fast twitch athlete he was in the in the octagon. Slowly but surely, kind of diminished. He didn't, you know, he didn't shrink in size, but whatever kind of you know uh force that he had in the octagon just completely died i don't know what happened maybe it's just a father time taking over because again he is 39 he's quite long in the tooth when it comes to fighting professionally you know he might be only only 39 in age but in terms of actually dog years and fighting in the octagon it's been a long 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 time so for him to go and suddenly try and fight a 24 year old with you know everything to gain nothing to lose really in this regard because no matter who jake paul fights he's always going to be I think this fight might be the only one where he might be the favourite, but in most of them, even if he loses, he still comes out of it victorious. The fact that he's willing to step in the ring with some of these killers is just, you know, says a lot about him as an athlete, as a person. So the pressure's always on the professional fighter, always on the pressure fighter, especially someone like a, you know, like a Tyron Woodley coming off a four loss, uh, a four loose loss streak. It's just, I don't know, man. I just, I don't see how this going to end well. And then we've got here this article from MMA Fighting that says Jake Paul, Tyron Woodley will be dropped by a Disney star in two rounds. <laughs> oh, this is horrible, man. This is absolutely horrible. Um, it says here, what did you see in his caption? Um, yeah, let's see here. Bah, 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 bah. It's official. What is the quote here? It says here, it's a fi- da, da, da. Um, Tyron ran his mouth a little too much in the locker room when I knocked out his best friend, uh, Ben Askren, and earned himself a top spot in the problem child <laughs> death list. Uh, Tyron's a seasoned striker who's fought in MMA fighters around the world, but will be dropped by a Disney teen star in two rounds. This guy is a troll, epic proportions. Uh, maybe this time Dana White will actually be a man of his word and put his money um, on his former champion instead of trying to undermine my success like a jealous ex-influencer VMMA. Let's get it on. It's showtime. Oh my God. Paul's boxing resume also includes a highlight real care from NBA guard, Nate Robinson, the undercard of the Triller event. Um, what's in, what Nate Robinson going to do? Does he have to come back and kind of, you know, uh, and a stripe again after that embarrassing knockout. I don't know. But yeah, I'd, uh, I don't know, man. Woodley's making his professional boxing debut after parting ways with the UFC. Let's see, man. Let's see. But I'm not really confident in Tyrone's ability to win this fight. I think if you've got any money, probably best to save it and spend it on a date night or buy yourself something nice. You know, there's no reason to put your money on Tyrone Woodley. I think it's going to end in tears. Um I think if you want to earn some money, maybe put it on Jake Paul. I think there's a good chance that he's going to probably turn it on once more and show the world that <laughs> he's a real legend killer when it comes to taking out some of our hallowed legends in the game. I, don't, I just don't see this ending well. I really don't. I just don't see this ending well. But maybe I could be wrong. Maybe I could be wrong. Next on the list, we have this news courtesy of TMZ. Jesus, pretty bad, isn't it? So I've been reporting on my main channel mostly about, you know, some of the ongoing stuff that's been happening within the LA comedy scene. Obviously, I'm a big fan of some of the podcasts out there and some of the individual stand-up careers have been, you know, nothing short of successful up to, up until 2019 when the world came crashing with all these allegations against some of the main proponents in there and it eventually led to a few people kind of you know disappearing completely some people getting cancelled people getting semi cancelled there's been a whole hope of absolute nonsense going on over there and the Brian Callen affair is one of those um, whole heaps of nonsenses and it just keeps rolling on and on and on and like I said before in other videos i still maintain that i think he probably dealt with it the the worst out of everyone that kind of got cancelled during that whole um amy kaufman hit list that she kind of was on when she was kind of you know writing article after article about people in the los angeles times i think brian callan definitely dealt with it the worst i still maintain it and i think that's part of the, the reason why we're seeing such kind of categorical l's he's been kind of you know taking over the last couple of years it's been pretty sad to see again as a former t5k fan as somebody that's been a huge fan of Callan's actual brand of stand-up comedy. I know it's not for some people. The whole physical comedy and the obsession with bodies and stuff can be a bit cringe. But I think overall, he's a really funny dude on stage. Probably um, supremely talented at stand-up, more so than he is acting. But unfortunately, you know, some people have desires to be things that they probably are not the best at. Um, even though when something else is screaming at them, so I can understand that, right? He's he's always kind of wanting to be an actor, even though he just happens to be good at stand-up. So that was always a bit of a conundrum. But it's been sad to see, you know, how it's kind of um kind of you know worked out from over the years but again is you only have yourself to blame really only have yourself to blame so this courtesy of tmz it says 
Brian can divorce. You get a house. I get a house. X also gets 20K per month. Like, I don't know why people get married in America. I really don't. Especially if you're a celebrity. It's just the laws there are absolutely insane so it says here uh brian kellen officially divorced while he's paying a nice chunk of change of support their assets are split pretty evenly right down to their two pups the acting comedian best known for his hangover and abc sitcom the Goldbergs, finalized his divorce with amanda humphrey earlier this month and according to the docs amanda gets a santa monica crib worth 3.4 million she also gets to keep at least 2019 Lexus GX 460 sports wagon and several bank accounts. Brian will also pay Amanda $11,496 per month in spousal support and $8,504 a month in child support for their two kids. They were 13 and 9 year old, whatever, right? Jesus Christ. This. And I wonder why this is, why is, I get maybe because they're under 18, if that makes sense, right? Maybe you have to play child support until they're 18 years old and then they can become adults and they kind of have to fend for themselves. But this idea that you have to kind of keep up spousal support for your partner, even though you're not together anymore, you know, every month for what? Until the day that they die is just pretty much insane. Maybe because it's LA and they work in the entertainment industry and there's this understanding that, you know, there's not a way to put value on what your partner does at home when you're out there on tour you know smashing all the girls on road and stuff and do whatever you're doing there's not a value you can put on it maybe that's one word one way to kind of see it but i just don't get this idea that how you can be in love with somebody be in a committed relationship and it doesn't work out for whatever reason it doesn't work out and if for some reason you are beholden to support them financially until the end of your time even though you're not together anymore right because part of the reason why you're together well when you're together you'd imagine like what's mine was yours but when they were not together why would you then continue it's like i don't know it's like um it would be a little bit weird if you end up breaking up with somebody and then you know the very next week you wanted to go over and you know borrow something from them to use like oh can i borrow your iron can i use this can i use that it should be strange part of the reason why you break up with somebody because you can't stand their company you want to have like a cream break and maybe move on to pastures new having them pop back in again to use your amenities just because you happen to have them is just a bit bizarre um same thing with this kind of monetary support i get it with the children again um you know even if it's until the end of their lives fair enough because you've both you know um decided to bring in two um life forms into this world and you owe it as parents to be supportive of them and if there is a possibility that the guy can run off and not be a good dad a good dude then maybe it's for the courts to step in and say no you owe these kids some level of monetary support if you're, you're going to give them your parental love fair enough but the spousal support thing is just odd i just find that very very odd it continues on speaking of the kids brian and amanda will share joint legal custody and have already hammered out a, a visitation schedule their two dogs are kind of a package deal with stella and finn the pets will be with amanda but when the kids are with brian he'll get the dogs however amanda keeps their house of course now brian's walking away from the venice home worth nearly two million in his two two hundred and 2014 Toyota Prius and his least 2019 Tesla Model S. He also keep the rights to his podcast to find a kid and some of his bank accounts. As we reported, Amanda filed for divorce back in 20, February 2020 after 12 years of marriage. The interesting part about it is again, because it's, you know, it's not really anyone's business, but because they keep pointing out all this information out to the public, it's kind of their fault. But I remember at the time when it was announced that they were getting divorced, a lot of, I think, predominantly Brendan was basically saying that, oh, it was a good thing, right? Like, um, Brian's actually looked the most happiest he's ever seen him now that he's divorcing his wife of 12 years who was there with him when he was in the trenches, you know, nothing but, you know, um, an afterthought in movies or whatever it may be and kind of, you know, slowly but surely peeing along in his Hollywood career. But regardless, right, um, this was kind of something that you kind of, they were trying to make out as this is a good thing. But the fact that Amanda was the one that initiated the divorce kind of led people to believe that maybe it wasn't all true how they were painting it to be now fair enough you have to kind of make the best out situation as you can but considering what's gone on considering what's happened in terms of brian's accusation and stuff you'd imagine maybe having somebody that's been actually with you through thick and thin would probably be a little bit more advantageous than being the single dude out on the prowl again in this new world where you've kind of been painted as a bit of a monster in terms of a bit of a creep it probably might not be the best avenue for you maybe who knows 
but I don't know, man. People in Hollywood have a strange way of looking at themselves and their position in the entertainment industry and all that malarkey. So maybe he just deep down generally feels like, no, this is a better move for me overall career wise. But what a what a weird way to end, you know, what was kind of a really stellar, you know, two or three years prior to the allegations, isn't it, right? Like stuff was really popping off in terms of the fire and the care. They were making, you know, cope, you know, money hand over fist, moving into new studios. It felt like every other month or so, getting really great guesting, great chemistry. Uh, Brian's, you know, stand up career was going pretty well. He was selling out different shows. He didn't got the Goldberg thing, got cast in the Joker, even though he was only in it for a couple of milliseconds. Um, got his own spin-off show or you know got a show got was allowed to star in another spin-off show i think i've got that one what it's called where you know it was another one but they did part of scored i think you know, goldbergs and then scored right and he was on that one for a bit things are looking really on the up and up and then suddenly chris Lee gets accused where he gets a, accused of brian Callan tries to distance himself from the guy deletes all his pictures from his instagram and tries to pretend like it was for his children or some bullshit and then suddenly the counterculture police come after him and then it's just a complete shit show after that in it right joe rogan hasn't really uttered his name that much since the allegations actually unfunnily enough even though he you know sometimes pretends to be the again a bastion of anti-council culture <laughs> But yeah, what a mad way to go about things. But I don't know, man. I, I'm just not a fan of the whole like spousal support until the day that you die thing. I think that's wild. I really don't know what the idea is behind that. Maybe I'm missing out on something, but I'm sure there's a rational reason why spousal support is a thing. Again, in some states, I'd imagine in the US, why it's actually a thing, why it makes sense. Maybe when it's a high caliber people like this, entertainment people, it might have some sense. Maybe high earning people, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but the, the idea that you need to maintain somebody's way of life for the rest of their life is just bizarre. Maybe there's a time period. I don't know what it is. Twenty years after you married, whatever. Let's say, if, let's say, um, you know, certain companies have that thing in contracts where they say for every year you work, you get one month severance, right? Some companies have that. Why don't we have that in terms of spousal support? So for every year that you're together, you get like a month of spousal support that I have to basically commit myself to. That's okay. No problem. Then it puts the onus down on trying to, you know, work it out as adults and be in a loving relationship because it's probably better off that you both stay in love and relationship or one that works than trying to split up because you're not going to get, you know, spousal support in that regard. But spousal support for the end of time is just bizarre um obviously having to look after your kids shouldn't should be a given but again the course may have to step in just in case the dad decides to do a bit of a runner but jesus man what a fall from grace what a fall from grace from brian Callan. but which basically explains why he's decided to go back on the front of the kid um supposedly the conspiracy social club has been booed off a of patron which is definitely going to be a dent to the finances that way but being able to keep up 20k in um you know spousal support and child support payments is just wild like how much you have to make on top of that to make that worth to make that kind of worthwhile what 40 60 100k per month like how much do you have to make that means he's going to be on the road for a while and you're going to see brian playing at some wild places over the next few years if you if you're kind of you know if you missed him in some of the key locations don't worry he's definitely going to be coming to a town near you very soon because that is no joke that's a lot of money that is a lot of money even for somebody that's at the top of their game 20k per month just on spousal support is just and child support commitments is just really nuts 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 but again maybe it shows you know he should have maybe taken more responsibility and care with his overall career outside of that maybe he wouldn't have been in a position that he's in at the moment who knows who knows what else we have here let's move on let's see how much time i've used up on this before i continue i've got a few more minutes left here so let's go here what else we got oh we got this little article here from dj mag um obviously with the dawning of the clubs being reopened on june 21st everyone's mostly focused on the people like myself who are going to be maybe behind the booth uh, behind the decks or on the dance floor but there's a lot of people surrounding you know the nighttime industry and all that malarkey who work in the background week to week kind of making sure these places are you know viable for us to enter in who are definitely going to be in for a bit of a i won't say a culture shock but it's going to be a little bit it's going to take some getting used to right to be in a enclosed area with loads of strangers and all that malarkey and all the tension and the kind of debauchery that occurs in nighttime after all these months spent at home and dj may kind of catalog some of these um 
insights courtesy of this article here it says how club workers are feeling about the return of events as the uk looks forward to the end of lockdown and the reopening of clubs and festivals julia julia botoro speaks to nightlife workers from different parts of the industry to paint a complex picture of their excitement and worry about the future and the particularly of their mental health yeah you didn't really hear too tough for it beforehand so maybe this is another good kind of um unintended consequence of the lockdown people kind of taking more of a serious look at some of the mental health aspects that affect people in and around nightlife especially the people that are just involved in it day to day we hear a lot about people entertainers and artists and the pressures around that but the people that actually work in it day to day definitely need our support in that regard too so the article says the following um ollie clark is out delivering amazon parcels around bristol in spring 2020 he's one of many workers at the royal mail hired during the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic as a public uh moves to shopping online during the first lockdown clark's new day job is far cry from his pre-pandemic life where he was assistant manager at a 300 capacity basement club basement 45 as the uk government struggled to manage the first wave of covid19 in the uk he has no idea when the venue will reopen just imagine how much of a i guess that's what adults do especially if you rent to pay you just kind of figure stuff out but imagine how much of a shock that must have been to the identity to go from being the assistant manager of a pretty well-known, you know, 300 capacity, I guess, club in Bristol. I've never been to that place, but I'd imagine it's pretty well regarded within the scene to go from that to suddenly delivering Amazon parcels. Like that must be a bit of a shock and your identity is wrapped up in being the kind of basement guy. And then suddenly having to pivot to delivering parcels is like, oof, it takes a lot in it. I guess it's a good thing because the only silver lining would be that a lot of the people that work within that life, I would imagine, come from humble origins, right? They've kind of bounced around from job to job, so it's not really a big deal in terms of going, having to do a certain thing in order to kind of allow you, because that's the kind of premise that people have when they do IB for residencies, right? When you do that thing. The idea behind that is that you kind of work there for a certain period of time, save some money, and then you kind of spend the rest of the time sort of enjoying yourself, right? But there's an idea of like seasonal workers, right? So maybe when you're back home, you might do some factory work to allow you then to go out and maybe, you know, party and work that way. So maybe that's the only silver lining of it, but that must have been a bit of a culture shock to say the least. It continues, it says, I knew I wanted to come back to this role at Basement 45. I didn't want to leave the industry at all. I have such a passion for it, Clark tells DJ Mag a year later in spring 2021. The government says saying they want to retrain, but I'm training this industry of events and bigger nightclubs. I've put a lot of effort into it, for sure. Um, they said the government's furlough scheme wasn't enough for him to survive on over the years so he has been taking up jobs while waiting for the restrictions to ease aside from Rob Miller he has worked for a meat factory and at bars he is now counting down the days to June 21st um, many clubbers are eager to hit the dance floor once coronavirus restrictions ease but if the pre-event excitement turns into nervousness they can sell their tickets and stay at home when the lockdowns are lifted nightlife workers won't have such a simple choice sorry if the people are overwhelmed about going back to working the events after a year of lockdown furlough and extended unemployment is not as easy as saying just quit on top of trying to cover their finances and careers being part of a live music industry is often tied to someone's identity and values with colleagues sometimes feeling like a second family of course that's what i'm saying so just imagine how much dread and excitement they're feeling combination of must be a really odd feeling going back there it continues here it says the balancing to the balancing the need to earning a living with physical and mental health risk of returning to work during a pandemic is a dilemma that's facing tens of thousands of nightlife workers uh, so how are they preparing themselves for the end of lockdown and the reopening of the venues lockdowns will be lifted across the uk in stages england has set june 21st as a date to drop all restrictions though at the same time of writing wales north island and scotland had them specified when clubs will reopen the nightlife industry has been hit harder than other parts of hospitality a report by the all party parliamentary group published in february found that uk clubs had cut 51 percent of their jobs since the pandemic started mamma mia um 51 percent of jobs have been cut since the pandemic started that's a whole lot of people in it that's why there's a lot of figures and articles coming out at the moment saying that a lot of these kind of service or these industries hospitality industry jobs are sort of struggling for staff because now that the world is or the uk is slowly opening up people are going back to their regular day jobs um and leaving those things behind like you know bars and pubs and clubs and stuff so they're having to fill these spots and they just don't have the staff at the moment so if you've ever wanted to get in and working at your know, kind of cool bar or whatever it may be this is definitely the best time to kind of get your foot in the door for sure because there's not a lot of 
there's not a lot of people really to kind of take those jobs. 31% of the jobs, da, 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 and while bars and pubs have asked 30, 50, 32% and 25% of their staff respectively. Um, people's expectations and the unknown have increased their levels of anxiety in a massive way, says Sylviana Kill, Director of Operations at the Nighttime Industries Association. The pandemic has been a fantastic hub of unanswered questions with people just not knowing one month to the next what's around the corner. The uncertainty is causing stress with venues and staff alike. Duncan McBean organises club nights in a pub in Forres, Scotland and he says it's been particularly difficult for smaller venues which de de uh, it's just detrimental for the music community at local level he says it can be disheartening even the council doesn't have answers for me people have been messaging me throughout the year wondering when we can get back to it saying that they didn't realise how much the events meant to them for sure that's what I've been doing um, it's not just in-house staff that lack the clarity there are hundreds of fans of freelancers artists and working in the IF industry who have had who had even more uncertain year than the furloughed peers Robert Elliott is a live freelancer lighting designer working in various London venues as well as UK international festivals he says being dynamic and freelance I'm used to a bit of uncertainty I kind of like it but this is another level it's a good time to have some off time um, as a pandemic as a music industry it never stops but the unsteady times made it hard to enjoy exactly man just imagine what it's like being a flipping fly designer right the person that designs flies for club events imagine that person you're probably spitting out flies out of your ass like you know a couple of hundred per month maybe more per year and now suddenly boom done no one's no one's asking you for artwork no one's asking you for jpeg or png files or you know whatever like mock-ups like nothing god damn it um while so many have spent this past year at home it's not necessarily been a restful period booking events into the canada is creating conversations about social and health anxiety while some people are excited to return to some sort of normality others are more cautious uh corrigan is an artist and former employee of Glasgow's sub club she worked in different roles including bartending and lightning and she says i feel comfortable um, I still feel uncomfortable about the no social distancing, but I'm sure I'll relax in time once I see for myself when it's going. Well, see for myself when it's time for that stage. I feel some sort of reluctance getting close to people right now. I'm much more sensitive of noise recently, and I have to make sure I've always have earplugs. Nightclubs can be intense, and I'm expecting to feel anxious as I've done with such as I've done such little socializing. I even get anxious um, going to a supermarket these days, and that's something that I've kind of said ad nauseum to everyone that will listen to me but i'm very skeptical about this idea that all of these events are going to be jam-packed and everyone's going to be overflowing in the streets and it's going to be the return of a new dawn of raving i think there's going to be a lot of excitement obviously the first couple of weeks first couple of months but then it's going to slowly but surely peter out. i think people's sensitivity to being in close proximity areas like that um as you mentioned having sensitivity to noise to people is def has definitely changed during our time in during covid and people's maybe just as people's maybe outlook and what they kind of desire for their life has definitely changed because for as much as i want to return back to club and i think some people might just be like you know what that might be a sign for me to kind of move on to other things so those people aren't necessarily going to be running back to the club at the first fall right they're going to be going to other things that they want to maybe go to so i think this idea that everything is going to be sold out and people should jump that's why i was kind of hesitant about putting on my own event that i was planning on doing i've kind of felt like mm, i just kind of just see how it goes the first couple of months and then we can go from there and i'm i'm in no doubt obviously by christmas you'll definitely see a more cons concentrated concert yeah, maybe a more concentrated group of actual ravers outdoors as opposed to general consumers i don't think you'll see the heady days of liverpool street being packed full of just tourists just eager to go out on the lash and stuff i think it's going to be a lot more tamer than what it was prior i think going forward of course i could be wrong but i definitely think people's sensitivity and overall outlook when it comes to these kind of things has definitely changed forever um it continues it says these feelings were echoed by andre dak owner and manager of ramsgate music hall in kent he said that he probably feels strange to be among crowds with restrictions in place he says it's such a unique scenario and i don't know how i react to being immersed in crowds until i'm there i'm more concerned about making other people feel at ease the staff and the audience once they return to the venues i'm not for uh, i'm not for uh I've not thought about myself, sorry. I've suffered from anxiety throughout my adult life, which is unfortunate, but it also means I've got a pretty firm grasp on what triggers it. Everyone's struggling out here, isn't it? Oh, look at that. Lovely bar. Continues here, says Gemma Midlich, operation manager at London Club E1, says the start of the outdoor events in April has allowed her to be a, more of a gradual return to a job. She says, I've been lucky because I've had a soft launch. I've been back to work with these daytime things. I've not got 
going straight in the deep end and I feel like this has definitely helped. If I hadn't done this, probably I would have been a more anxious. Some are concerned about keeping the health habits they've been developing over the lockdown. Elizabeth, a bartender in London, said she's been killed getting more sleep and stressed about returning to a tough schedule of nightlife. She says, before I got to accept more that I can... So sorry, before I used to accept more that I can do so maybe I've learned that I'll just have to give myself more breaks um, I just have to be kind to myself and follow my body because I only have one that's definitely true in it right the healthier habits people have developed going to bed at a certain time eating a specific diet maybe going on walks exercising more you know whatever reading men, you know, mental health stuff meditating doing less drugs all that sort of stuff has probably been a good thing for most people so having to kind of go back to that scene where you're kind of coaxed into doing those more nefarious things and you're put around more temptation that isn't probably the most healthiest thing for you isn't going to be a good thing but you know who knows it continues as that's exactly what Rose, uh, Rosa Ramon, a recovery coach and member of the music industry therapist collective, advised Nightly Focus to do. She says it's an opportunity to practice consent in a way. What have you learned about yourself and your need over this period? How can you support yourself or ask for the help that you need? What can you do for others after you've been to work? Can you implement a self care routine that doesn't look like grabbing a bottle or a bag? Just really take care of yourself, attending to those persons who frightened or overwhelmed when they have to go back after the global trauma that we've been through into a situation which is now a complete opposite while some worry about the physical toll on nightlife others are reflecting on the impact of their free time um, although it's nothing new that this industry doesn't really work with unsociable hours it means that this year's workers won't get to enjoy the end of lockdown like everyone else the people that are serving oh true i never thought about that. that's a very good point the people that are serving the drinks and making sure that everything is working i also haven't seen their friends um she says uh was that Ry Ryle edward richness the manager of the lion and lamb a london pub that doubles a music venue we aren't open on mondays and tuesdays so i won't go to have to go back to work then that's fine but all of my friends work Mondays and Tuesdays it's that balance between being able to see your friends and at any point and also wanting to do the best for your company you work for it's going to be very difficult he talked about a sense of isolation for personality workers which he feels um, has persevered as more risky to hang out with because contact with public says I understand people's reaction he says I don't blame anyone for anything right now but at the same time for the people that are working in pubs and bars and clubs it does get way heavier on our mind you think good god people don't want to see me i should just do something else now why am i working in a pub if it means that i can't see my family um it's something that almost if you're not working in a bar i think you wouldn't really understand it's quite difficult to talk about with housemates or friends for sure you know what i mean everyone's working a conventional nine to five remotely at home and stuff got a flexible schedule and here you are back out on the front line you know serving drinks and making sure you're keeping you know strangers girls ponytails out of their mouth whilst they vomit into really spotty toilets um but yeah long article there you can read the rest of it but yeah it's going to be an epic time on the dance floors again i think for those of us that are able to go out you know don't take it for granted use that time wisely thank the people that are there tip people well don't be asking people for flipping guest list spots when you go out and stuff you know pay the entry fee that needs to be paid in order to get in and just enjoy it for what it is because there's no really telling you know we've already given these governments too much control over our civil liberties there's no real telling you know when that will get taken away from us again so don't take it for granted enjoy it for what it is at the moment it's given to you uh, make the best of it look after your friends and people around you and stuff and then go from there just go from there anyway that is the excellent single show episode number 464 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time tuning into the show you know what to do smash that like button hit subscribe leave a comment down below and of course if you're listening via the podcast app a five star review will help the show go a long way and of course support via patrons always more than welcome you can get access to all my bonus content for as little as one dollar one pound per month at patreon.com for us agostino that's patreon.com for us a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o get involved on there today don't delay but i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace